All right, we're going to make a start. Uh, thanks for those of you that have come here and for those joining online. So it's a pleasure to have uh, Marius Meyerhofer and uh, Doris Leitner giving these talks today. So we have these two guest speakers, very international, coming all the way from New York just to talk to us today. Uh, and Marius is actually an old acquaintance of the department. He was an e SOR fellow mm -hmm. and, uh, a while back, so he knows Ferdia for, has known Ferdia for, for many years. And uh, interestingly, he has a lot of interest and expertise in nuclear medicine, which is something we don't get enough of here. So an opportunity for us to get to know what's happening at Memorial and uh, sort of broaden our horizons. So uh, thanks, Maris. So, so we have these two talks. Maris is gonna talk for the first 40 minutes and Doris gives the other talk and then we'll have a general discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much for the introduction. And um, yes, it's always a pleasure to be to be back in Cambridge. I really enjoyed my time here when I was here in 2011, so quite some some years ago. But always a pleasure, such a delightful delightful atmosphere and a delightful place. So as you can see, I will be speaking about um, novel imaging techniques in hematological malignancies. That's my main interest. It's not my only interest, but it's my main interest in terms of imaging. And I think we can actually start this talk by looking at what, well, first of all, my disclosures, obviously. And then what is the state of the art before we can talk about novel things? What is the state of the art? Obviously, FDG PET. There is, I think, no other cancer where um, FDG PET is so well established um, than in, in lymphoma and other blood cancers. It's actually the only um, tracer that's being recommended at the moment for FDG avid lymphomas according to the Lugano guideline. We know that when we compare it to CT, it, it has vastly improves, especially the sensitivity, and it's only far superior to CT in terms of. Um, treatment response assessment, which is one of the main um, things in also for the oncologists, uh, we, we, just by comparing uh, semi-quantitatively to um, uptake in the liver, we can determine whether there is post-treatment still viable disease or not. Now, the same is actually now true uh, for myeloma and even um, in a earlier stage, even for suspected myeloma, in the precursor stage, we could use FDG PET, but there the situation is slightly different. And we have FDG PET next to MRI as well as CT. You can see this cascade here um, of which FDG PET is part, but also MRI. We know again, like in lymphoma for um, response assessment, it's the test to use it also now uses the same Deville score that is used in lymphoma. So just visual comparison, maybe with some, some SUV measurements as in lymphoma. And this has been shown to be prognostic in myeloma, both for focal lesions and also for diffuse marrow uptake. So of course, visual analysis is not everything. You know, the field of imaging in general, not just for PET, but for all the imaging tests, is going in the quantitative direction. And obviously, everybody knows the SUVs. I think most of you <coughs> have heard about metabolic tumor volume and also total lesion glycolysis for FDG PET, which is basically calculated on SUV and MTV. But there are other ways to look at um, the uptake, and that is a more heterogeneity-based way of looking at things. You have definitely heard the term radiomics, I guess, which is linked to AI. So both have a very similar idea in extracting features that could be, in one way or the other, for instance, prognostic, even the baseline. And if you look at um, recent studies that used quantitative PET information, here just the um, metabolic tumor volume in conjunction with some clinical parameters, like in this huge study from, from two randomized clinical trials, it's actually very big for such a study, 
Clinicians would normally use the International Prognostic Index in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, but this combination, this quantitative PET metric in combination with the clinical parameters actually performed better in terms of outcome prediction than the standard clinical um, prognostic index. And then, as I mentioned, it's not just metabolic tumor volume, but it could also be radiomic features. That's actually quite, quite similar um, to what I showed before. Also, rather large cohort built from randomized clinical trials, and the combination of different radiomic features was able to stratify better than um, the clinical score alone. So in combination with the clinical score, the radiomic features clearly improved the outcome prediction. But there are limitations, and that's why I wanted to start with FDG, because, I mean, all of you know that the work with FDG had no those limitations, the biodistribution. You have strong physiologic uptake, or at least moderate physiologic uptake in several of the organs, obviously in the brain, which is not really a surprise given the um, glucose that's utilized there, but also in the liver, also excretion via the urinary tract. That's an example, for instance, that's actually not a blood cancer, but something else that's a GIST tumor, and that's a follow-up scan, nothing remarkable here. And also when you look at the PET itself, not, not really remarkable, but look at the MRI, there's something that you probably missed, or at least I did, this lesion here, this lesion in the kidney with diffusion restriction on the ADC map, well, that corresponds to that. It's just very difficult to see due to the adjacent physiologic excretion of the tracer. And not all tumors are FDG avid. Not all of them have a a high glucose metabolism. Some of them even lack hexokinase too. And that, for instance, is a myeloma patient. You can very clearly see those two lesions and they are not small. So you can't blame it on the resolution. Those two lesions here, myeloma lesions, are just not visible. They don't show uptake because they, we know that about 10% of multiple myelomas lack hexokinase 2 expression. So you can't really use FDG PET well. It's also unreliable for diffuse bone marrow involvement. And I'll show you examples for that here. And I showed this today in the, in the lecture to the registrars. Those are all patients at baseline, six different patients with mantle cell lymphoma at baseline. Which ones have bone marrow involvement and which ones don't? It's really not, not an easy thing. Let me show you the top row is positive, the bottom row is negative. You cannot rely on FDG PET for diffuse bone marrow involvement in hematologic malignancies. And if you look at the list of lymphomas here, not all lymphoma subtypes, and that's why I always stress the histology so much, not all lymphoma subtypes are really FDG avid. Of course, some of the most common ones, diffuse large B cell and Hodgkin lymphoma, they are but others that are also quite common, like the marginal zone lymphomas or small lymphocytic lymphoma CLL, or the, they, they will have a much lower percentage of FDG avidity. And look at this huge Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia. That's a huge lesion. But even at baseline, the uptake is, I mean, not really higher than in the liver, maybe some patches here and there. You can't really use FDG PET well. So that's why for the rest of the talk, I will focus on novel imaging techniques and my, my personal favorite, probably because I've done quite some work in the last couple of years is um, CXCR4 imaging with a, a tracer called Pentixa4 that you can label with gallium 68. What is CXCR4? It's a chemokine receptor that has a key function for well, actually a couple of biological processes, but in particular also for cell migration and homing. So homing basically just means that it helps the cancer cells reach their target tissues, which offer a protective microenvironment, for instance, the bone marrow or the lymph nodes when the cells are in the bloodstream. And that is an interesting target um, also 
for, for the oncologists and also for nuclear medicine, as we will hear in the second talk. So because CXCR4 is overexpressed in blood cancers, it's particularly useful there, as I hope you will see in the next couple of slides, but not only, there are other cancers that have this expression too. And looking at the biodistribution here, what can you see? Well, first of all, it's striking there is no CNS uptake at all. There is moderate uptake in the spleen, which is not surprising because the um, blood cells have a certain expression of CXCR4 physiologically. There is less uptake in the liver than you know from FDG. You also have the excretion um, via the urinary system. Sometimes, and I'll mention that right away, in inflammatory nodes, you can see this low level uptake in these small neck nodes. We know from, well, not from imaging data, um, but from tissue biopsies, that CXCR4 expression also has a prognostic meaning in uh, some cancers, including blood cancers. So that's another reason why this target is of interest. And let me just briefly go to a um, lymphoma subtype where this could be useful. We know that mantle cell lymphoma, for instance, and again, that's one of the top five non-Hodgkin lymphomas, can be indolent, like in this case, low uptake on FDG, not really higher than the liver, although the tumor mass is substantial. But it can also be aggressive, and then obviously FDG works very well. It has a poor prognosis, and most patients are diagnosed in the later stage. Here is another case where you see just how many of those lymph nodes and also involved small bowel loops that you can very nicely see on DWI are actually non-FDG avid. The most FDG avid thing that you can see here is the thyroid adenoma, but not the lymphoma. So that's a study that I did a few years ago, two years ago exactly, um, in mantle cell lymphoma, comparing it to FDG PET. We did not initially look at whether the lymphoma was more indolent or more aggressive. We just took all the mantle cell lymphoma patients that we could get and had the scan done um, within three days of each other. So the FDG PET, and you can, I mean, instantly see how many lesions are not or really only mildly FDG avid, whereas they show substantial uptake on the Pentixophor PET. So the difference in terms of sensitivity here, I mean, obviously, like with any novel tracer, any novel supposed biomarker, the number of patients was not that large. And it was mixed, of course, treatment naive and relapsed. But the sensitivity in that small cohort was higher for Pentixophor by quite a bit, actually. And interestingly, some of the quantitative um, markers, the SUVs and also the tumor to background ratio compared to blood pool and liver, suggested that maybe this tracer works better for assessment of bone marrow involvement compared to biopsies than FDG PET. And again, you can very nicely see that all those lesions depicted by Pentixophor, they are there. You can see them on MR. We did this on a, on a, on a PET MR scanner and they are there. This is not some artificial uptake. And in cases where basically the um, same amount of lesions, the same tumor burden was also identified by FDG PET, you could see that the tumor to background ratio was obviously much better um, with Pentixophor. And obviously you wonder, maybe the uptake is not, maybe the CXCL4 expression is maybe not in the tumor cells, but maybe in the surrounding inflammatory cells, well, it's not. We, we correlated that with the biopsies. It's not that the correlation was perfect, but then again, you would not expect that. Mantle cell lymphoma has a high clonal heterogeneity, so obviously a biopsy taken from one site might not be representative of the entire tumor burden. And that's really the beauty of whole body imaging techniques, such as PET. That um, was on a couple of patients that underwent a second scan where we just wanted to see because the way that FDG PET was really well established is because 
the research showed that it picks up treatment response and in particular complete remission post-treatment earlier than morphology, so size measurements based on CT. So we wanted to see whether that's actually also true for pentixophore, and it actually was. Compared to MRI, and we are talking strictly about morphological criteria here, so we did not use any functional MR techniques, but really just size measurements, the um, complete remission rate was higher. And to confirm that this actually meant there was complete remission, we did further follow-up scans, either with just CT or, in this case, um, FDG PET CT. And you can see that this node that was post-treatment negative on pentixophore remained negative also at a later time point at FDG PET and was unchanged. So it was actually, although it was above the level, size level, <clears throat> expected to be to reflect complete remission on CT. This was a complete remission detected earlier than based on size criteria. Another interesting lymphoma subtype is marginal zone lymphoma for which the Lugano guideline does not recommend FDG PET because it's so often not FDG avid or mildly FDG avid. We know that some of these cases transform to diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. That's maybe the only justification, the only real justification for using FDG PET despite the Lugano recommendations. Here you have a splenic marginal zone lymphoma. Here it actually FDG performed um, nicely. We know that sometimes because especially mold lymphoma, so the extra novel variant of marginal zone lymphoma is so slowly growing, with FDG, you could theoretically image at a later time point. You see at the standard time point, 60 minutes after injection, you don't really see this gastric mold lymphoma, but you see it at a later time point. But the question is, does, because FDG PET is not recommended, does pentixophore perform better? And we tried that in different settings. The first was rather, um, let's take all the marginal zone lymphomas and compare the two scans again. This is this study here, and obviously you do see some mild uptake on FDG PET in this huge adrenal gland lymphoma manifestation, but there is no comparison um, with the lesion to background contrast on pentixophore. And interestingly, and you probably spotted that uptake, that focal uptake here, which is actually located at the back of the orbital here, so behind, behind the eye. No uptake, no visible uptake on FDG PET, and you see it very nicely on pentixophore, and it also has a correlate on, this, on the ADC map here. So that's actually there and was proven to be a mold lymphoma lesion. And then we applied this also in gastric mold lymphoma. You know that um, this is the most common uh, lymphoma type in the stomach. And what's important, patients with gastric mold lymphoma undergo endoscopy every three to six months, including biopsies. That's quite a lot. Imagine having to have endoscopy and gastric biopsies in such short time intervals. So that's why it was particularly interesting. And so here we used post-treatment, so post-helicobacter um, eradication scans to see whether Pentixophore could actually compete with biopsy here. The accuracy was much higher than we expected, actually, and also the correlation was, again, significant, though not, uh, not too high, again, as expected, due to the sampling by the biopsies, whereas for Pentixophore, it obviously captures the whole lesion. You could nicely see the good agreement between the CXCF4 stain and the degree of pentixophore uptake here. Not all of them are highly CXCR4 expressing, but for the ones, at least for the ones that show high CXCR4 expression, and you will know that from the first biopsy, that might actually be a technique to at least partially eliminate these um, short interval endoscopy and biopsy procedures.
And then, as you saw on the comparative slide with um, FDG PET and Pentixophone next to each other, you can see obviously no uptake in the CNS, whereas a lesion like this CNS lymphoma here has a, I mean, nothing's perfect, but it has an unbelievably high lesion to background contrast. It correlates very nicely what you see um, with what you see on MRI, on the standard MRI scans. So that could be an option too, although like in all these studies, since the, the tracer is still rather new, small patient cohort, this is the main limitation at the moment. We could also see that the um, correlation post-treatment is really nice. You can see at this point where at least on the contrast enhanced scan, you would have some difficulties in um, saying whether this is, this is actually still viable disease or not. But by how much the uptake decreased basically to the level of the um, bone marrow and, and soft tissue uptake or the blood pool as you can see in the sinus here. So again, maybe that's a good option there too because biopsies are obviously not as easy as in, in, in body lymphomas. Other groups have looked at um, this tracer in other lymphomas, in this case, the lymphoplasmocytic lymphoma, so Morbus Waldenstrom. Remember, I showed you this big lesion that was not really much FDG avid. Well, Waldenstrom in the bone marrow is basically hard to detect on FDG PET. And look at what you see, what this group, this um, Chinese group found um, when looking at pentixophore, and similar to what we saw in mantle cell lymphoma, it looks like pentixophore can also um, assess treatment response rather well. So another application here. And then we also looked at um, CLL, so SLL, CLL. And again, there is no recommendation in the clinical guidelines, in the Lugano guidelines, to use FDG PET unless you're re really expecting a transformation to a higher grade um, lymphoma. These patients are often treated with ibrutinib. That's a brutin's tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And it has a very unique effect. It has an indirect effect on C the CXCL4, CXCL12 axis. So it disrupts this um, interaction. And clinically, it's known to, in, to lead to a leukocytosis early on during the treatment. And we were amazed when we tried this out under rebrutinib treatment to see just that very effect. So the uptake in the nodal lymphoma manifestations went down under ibrutinib treatment also slightly in the bone marrow, not as much as in the, in the nodal lymphoma manifestations, but the uptake in the, in the spleen went up. So that's exactly this so-called compartment shift where the cells during under ibrutinib treatment can basically not find their way back to the target tissues, to the lymphatic tissues, end up in the bloodstream and therefore end up in the spleen. And we saw that in all the patients, it was a tran transient effect and correlated nicely what you could, with what you could see in the, in the blood tests. And of course, blood cancers is not just, uh, not just lymphoma. This is multiple myeloma. And as I mentioned before, 10% of these patients do not have hexokinase 2 expression, so they will not be so what FDG pad will actually not be useful there. It's um, on the whole, Pentixophore performed much better in this, in this study than FDG pad, not always, but in most cases. It's um, similar to what we saw in, in mantle cell lymphoma actually. But in most patients, it worked really well and also for the diffuse bone marrow uptake, that's always an issue with FDG. Another thing that's interesting, you know, multiple myeloma does not start as multiple myeloma. It's basically, it starts as a monoclonal gammopathy of unclear significance, then progresses to so-called smoldering myeloma, where there is no end organ damage yet, 
and then it progresses to true multiple myeloma where you have the basically irreversible bone damage. And that's why it would be of interest to actually see if one could use a tracer in this smoldering myeloma stage. And again, this is quite a, a small study, but it looks like that pentixaform may perform well in this setting too. Now, another concept um, is immunopet. And usually one thinks of immunopet as labeling an antibody or an antibody fragment. It could nevertheless also be a small molecule. With the antibodies, what you usually need is a longer-lived radionuclide, so you unfortunately can't do it like you can with um, FDG or also with them um, with um, antixafor, but you have to wait longer until the biodistribution is optimal, until you have optimal lesion to background contrast, as was shown, for instance, with rituximab, one of the drugs basically uh, used in, in blood cancers. One tracer that has recently gathered a lot of attention, and because it's sort of a small molecule, is FAPI. I guess you may have heard about it. FAPI tracks cancer-associated fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. And depending on the type of tumor, these fibroblasts contribute a lot in terms of volume to the overall tumor mass. And once the fibroblasts are recruited by the tumor itself, they are modified and have several tumor-promoting effects. Now, these cancer-associated fibroblasts show an overexpression of the so-called fibroblast activation protein, FAP, which can be targeted with a radio-labeled inhibitor. And it's amazing to see the biodistribution of FAPI here. You have hardly any background um, signal. We know that FAP per se is also a possible prognostic biomarkers. Numerous cancers have been shown to overexpress FAPI. So this is not, this is the real application probably would be to be a better FDG maybe for some cancers. In all the studies that came out, um, this, this view has been expressed at least, at least in the studies so far. You see this um, very strong FAPI uptake in several of the cancers that are known to be a challenge for FDG. Just think about some of the breast cancers, pancreatic adenocarcinoma, where we always have issues with FDG seeing the primary cancer, not so much the metastasis, but the primary cancer can be very tricky. The gyne cancers, maybe even prostate, although we know that that PSMA now seems to be the main thing. But Quite interesting to see that. Now, since my talk is about the blood cancers, is there any data on that? And there actually is, and in different lymphoma subtypes. And the pattern that I noticed was that it actually, in terms of SUV and, and, and uptake, it's not that different from FDG. It's more the aggressive ones that show higher uptake, and the indolent ones, I mean, the numbers are quite low for those, but malt lymphoma, well, not that much. Also SLL, CLL. So it, it seems to be similar to FDG in that regard, which differs from um, Antixafor, where the indolent lymphomas all show very strong uptake. And then again, it has been shown that although the previous biodistribution seemed to suggest that basically no background, you do have some pitfalls here. So the mammary glands, degenerative disease, like you know from FDG, often you will see an uptake in the atrosis. In part also the musculature, wound healing, the endometrium. I mean, that changes with age though, but still it is something to consider. Nevertheless, that's a very interesting tracer and you will hear a bit more about it in the um, next talk that's, fo that's focused also on, on the theranostic application. Another target, and the next two targets I will keep rather short because most of the data there is actually not from the blood cancers, but 
we know, for instance, the, the checkpoint inhibitors that are being used, MTPD1 and MTPDL1, are also either already established in the blood cancers, like in some lymphomas, or trialed like um, uh, PDL1 antibodies. And looking at this study from 2019, you could nicely see that there is quite some heterogeneity between patients, also between lesions and between tumor types in terms of uptake. Again, since this is an antibody, this time zirconium was used, so imaging at a much later time point than um, with FDG or also FAPI. And it's interesting to see that the, from a prognostic point of view, the uptake um, was more prognostic or predictive than um, the IHC findings. And again, this is not really surprising given that as a whole body technique, the entire tumor burden is covered, whereas one biopsy might not be representative. Then also tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, so-called TILs, might be of interest. We know that um, baseline CD8 positive TIL expression is prognostic, also probably during treatment. That's a melanoma patient here, and this study was performed um, at Memorial uh, using a CD8 targeting mini body. That's a melanoma patient. You can see physiologic uptake of the tracer in the bone marrow. Obviously, you would expect um, lymphocytes there. But with both um, the CD8 plus targeted PET and FDG showed was this lesion here that was confirmed to be a melanoma metastasis. So some activity here. And it seemed in a follow-up study that the uptake was indeed possibly predictive of the outcome during treatment. You could see the activity one month post immunotherapy in lesions that then went on to have complete remission. Finally, a CD38 targeted immunopath has been performed also at our institution by Gary Ulena, who meanwhile, unfortunately, left our institution. Again, for that, the rationale is that daratumumab, which, which targets um, CD38, is quite well established in the treatment of several lymphomas and especially also myeloma, relapsed myeloma or treatment refractory myeloma in particular. So in this case, um, zirconium DFO daratumumab was used to image CD38 in vivo the first inhuman study that was published in radiology demonstrated safety with three milligram of, of radial labeled um, daratumumab. You can see the number of lesions really nicely picked up and showing also, sorry, showing also lesions that were not visible on FDG PET. And I've spoken so much about PET now that you keep wondering, is that just PET in terms of, of, of novel developments for the hematological malignancies? Well, probably not. There are certainly other techniques that could be used as well. I will focus just on one, and that's um, MRI with fermoxetol. Fermoxetol um, is used off-label, as you will see, to image macrophages, tumor-associated macrophages. Why is that of interest? Those tumor-associated macrophages make up a significant proportion of the tumor mass. It really depends on the type of cancer. There is this polarization model of the tumor-associated macrophages. They can be M1, meaning that they have an anti-tumor effect, or they can be M2. I don't know if some of you have a background in immunology, then you probably know 10 times better than I do about this topic. And again, the M2 macrophages, they promote tumor invasiveness. They promote metastasis, for instance. So it's no wonder that the macrophages seem to be prognostic as well. I know I'm speaking a lot about possible prognostic factors, but that's really where imaging is also moving. So what way is there to image that? As I mentioned, ferromoxetol. That's an ion nanoparticle. Obviously, being an ion nanoparticle, 
this will have an effect on um, the magnetic field. It's actually not an MR contrast. It's there for treatment of iron deficiency anemia, but it can be used and has been used quite extensively actually um, for MR imaging, not necessarily for the tumor associated macrophages, but especially also, as you can see in the um, first about 15, 24 hours post injection as an MR angiography um, agent. So that's, that's where we have data from, and I'll show you this data in a moment. Importantly, the, um, the dose used for MR imaging is much lower than the one used for therapy. You can see that if you want to see the macrophages, you actually have to wait a bit. You have to wait for at least 24 hours until the uh, until thermoxetol is taken up by the macrophages. Before that, you will mainly have the vascular contrast. And then you can use um, T2 star mapping, for instance, um, but just also quite as a broad, broad use T2 um, weighted imaging to see the effect of thermoxetol as a negative contrast agent. These data are from a registry study that was performed to look at the safety of ferromoxetol MRI because with the therapeutic application, there have been serious adverse events and death. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. But with the diagnostic um, doses, that has not been the case. So that's, that's also important because for the therapeutic application, this rather high dose of ferromoxetol is injected in the bolus, whereas for MRI, you would inject it rather slowly, over 15 minutes, diluted, one to four, and then it looks like it, it does not lead to any serious adverse events. Actually, if you compare it to the gadolinium-based um, agents, it, it even may be less problematic. So that's um, a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma with T2 star imaging. And as a correlate, we have FDG PET. What do you see? pre in this diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, not much. After ferromoxetol, you see some, some septa-like uptake um, 24 hours later after ferromoxetol injection, interestingly also in this peripheral zone. And this seems to correspond to this peripheral lower uptake. This is obviously the growth and, and invasion zone of the, um, of the uh, lymphoma here. So quite interesting to see that. A couple of studies have been performed on this topic. Also to see, well, what can we actually track with ferromoxetol? Can we track the M1 macrophages? Can we track the M2 macrophages? Or is this sort of non-selective? I mean, there is not really much data out, of, uh, out on this topic. This is from lymphoma patients. And you can see there is a correlation with both, actually, which is maybe not what one was hoping for. We will see as we get more data if, if that trend um, continues to be to be observed. It also seems like um, at least that's the point that was made in this study. Um, that lymphomas being less aggressive than, for instance, bone sarcomas have a lower proportion of M2 macrophages and that the T2 star shortening that means the ferromoxetol uptake is lower in lymphoma than in sarcoma, and so maybe it may be useful um, to determine tumor aggressiveness. What's probably the most interesting application, though, is to use it with um, therapeutic um, agents that target CD47, because CD47 is used by cancer cells to transmit a do not eat me signal to macrophages. So that's a checkpoint that one would actually like to target therapeutically. And it was nicely shown in this, I mean, that's, that's, an, that's an animal study, but still in the cohort where you 
In addition to doxorubicin, also administered a CD47 antibody, and where you can, for that reason, also see a higher influx of macrophages into the tumor, probably anti-tumor macrophages, the rate of response was much better, actually. So that is something that, that several um, pharmaceutical companies are interested in and where this technique could actually be very useful. So let me sum that up. Of the novel techniques, personally, I'm a huge fan of Pentixophore, so that's um, CXCR4 imaging, especially in those lymphomas where we know that FTG does not perform well. Those are some of the indolent lymphomas and they are not exactly rare, like the marginal zone lymphomas, for instance, but also CNS lymphomas, where you have really limited options and where you have a strong physiologic uptake um, with FTG PET. FAPI, I mean, that's not interesting for the, for the blood cancers uh, exclusively, but for most cancers, it seems, because of the high tumor to background contrast, the limited data that we have suggested, at least in lymphomas, it might be similar um, to what we know from FTG, so aggressive subtypes showing higher uptake. But as you will see in the next, in the next lecture, um, FAPI is interesting for another reason as well, from a therapeutic point of view. Certainly uh, of interest are also the immunopath um, techniques like CD38, especially when you have a target that's also used for therapeutic agents. And for daratumumab, this is certainly the case. This is well established. But also P1 and PDL1 may be interesting targets. The only thing is that at least at the moment, we need longer lived radionuclides, which has obvious effects on the workflow. It's, we, we can't do PET imaging like we are used to with FTG or also with Pentixafor. And finally, MRI with fermoxetol, so imaging of the tumor-associated macrophages may be interesting both as a prognostic marker, but also when you combine it with therapies um, that, that look at CD47, that target CD47. So that's my summary. I hope I was able to present you some interesting results. I focused mainly on the, or actually exclusively now, on the diagnostic part, but the next talk will be quite different. Thank you very much for your attention. So, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Um, so, unlike Marius, this is my first time in Cambridge, and I'm very happy and honored to speak here today. So, thank you very much. And my topic today is theranostics. Um, this is a term that's been formed from the words therapeutic and diagnostics. And in nuclear medicine, it describes the combination of diagnostic and therapeutic tools related to the same molecular target. Oops, oh, excuse me. Wait, oh, I didn't share, oh my god. My bad. We did it. I think it, did it close? I hear, <laughs> apologies. Working out? Perfect. 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 Wonderful. Okay, so therapeutic and diagnostics and in nuclear medicine it's the combination of these two aspects that we are interested in. And so the term is relatively new, however the approach is of course not. For example, when we think about radioiodine therapy, this is exactly what uh, aeronostics is about. So we use kind of the same target for therapy and then imaging to see how the therapy is working and where it's going. So most of the theranostic agents that we use now uh, use cancer cell surface receptor overexpression. And the advantage or the goal of theranostics is to have a very accurate patient selection. It's also relatively cancer specific. And also uh, one wants to uh, make a good response evaluation. Although this is of course not perfect. For example, with Dodatate, we don't have really response criteria that are being used right now, but this is the goal of theranostics for the future. So when we think about choosing a radionuclide, um, so right now primarily used are beta or alpha particle emitters, beta for example with lutetium, lutathera or alpha with sofigo. And 
Um, the half-life for a radionuclide would ideally be six hours to 11 days so that the tumor can take it up well, but that it doesn't linger around, around for too long. The radionuclide uh, leads to direct and indirect cell destruction. And when one chooses one, of course, energy and distance traveled by the nuclide must be considered. For example, a low energy radionuclide with a small distance traveled would be ideal, for example, for um, smaller metastases. However, if we flew the Terra, for example, when we think about uh, yttrium-90, for example, there is a high energy and a large distance traveled. So this is more ideal for larger metastases. So right now, let me go back. So right now on the left side, you can see we have so many. These are not all of them, of course. We have a lot of theranostic agents right now. And this is an endless topic, so I wanted to touch on those where I heard that you're doing this as well here in Cambridge and we're doing it at Sloan Kettering. So Lutetium PSMA, one of the most exciting ones to be FDA approved very recently. Also Lutetium Dolatate, which is relatively established. And I wanted to complete, of course, what Marius has been saying with Bintixatir and a radio-labeled Fabi. So when we start with right now with Pluvictu, I wanted to give a special, um, special emphasis on Pluvictu because I think it's a very exciting new topic. So, but when we talk about prostate cancer, it's very important to know that prostate cancer is a very heterogeneous disease. So it begins as a very localized disease. Patients have uh, their primary lesion, they get their radical prostatectomy, radiation therapy, and then at some point they have again a rising PSA, they become biochemically recurrent and then they start uh, androgen deprivation therapy and at some point they become castrate resistant. And these metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancers is a very important patient population because overall survival is below three years and we really have a need for durable treatment options in these patients. So chemotherapy, other systemic therapies are quite limited. Also, 30% really of prostate cancers actually progress to metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. And this is where PSMA comes into play. This is prostate specific membrane antigen. It is expressed in physiologic prostate tissue as well, but overexpressed in over 90% of prostate cancers. And PSMA expression is positively correlated with aggressive disease. This means higher Gleason score, higher PSA, and uh, higher. Um, more early recurrence in metastases. For example, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer also has the higher PS PSMA values. So recently, some diagnostic agents uh, were FDA approved and are very exciting and are being incorporated into the standard of care. This is Scallium 68 PSMA and also Polarify. And from a theranostic point of view, the most common radiopharmaceutical that is now being used is Lutetium-177 PSMA-617 or Pluvicto. This has been FDA approved very recently in 2022. And on the right side, you can see the structure of PSMA-617 with the radionuclide inside the chelator, then the PSMA binding motif and is all put together by a linker. When we talk about castrate resistant prostate cancer, it's very important to know that the patient selection is crucial because 20 to 30% of these patients have a low PSMA expression or a heterogeneous expression with discordant PSMA and FDG avidity. And especially these patients have a poor prognosis and short survival. For example, you see this patient here with a lot of PSMA avid disease. However, in the liver, it is really apparent in, on FTG imaging here in red. So it's very important to really choose your patients wisely. So I want to show you some of the trials that led to the approval of this radiopharmaceutical. This was an important one. This is a therapy trial where they um, compared Pluvicto with cabezitaxel chemotherapy. They excluded um, patients that were FTG positive on imaging, so they had a very had a homogeneous patient, co um, patient cohort. And then they found out that, um, that uh, Pluvictor actually led to a PSA reduction in 66% compared to 37% on cabazitaxel. Also progression-free survival was better in the PSMA group and also troublesome adverse events were less. So as you can see, the response rate is 
good but not perfect. It's about 50 to 60 percent, so there is definitely room for improvement. And we don't know which patients will react favorably to pluvictum, which won't. So in the future, we would really need biomarkers to predict response, to characterize patients, and to include the right patients for the right treatment. So we don't know why some tumors respond and some don't. Maybe it's due to radiation dose, because we administer the exact same radiation tools to all the patients. So maybe dosimetry would be interesting for the future. Also, some tumors or some patients might not be as sensitive to radiation. And also a problem might be the level of PSMA expression. So right now, we don't have really any guidelines for level of PSMA expression. So some say, oh, PSMA expression to be ideal for PRT must be at least 1.5 times liver, uh, liver SUV max. Or you can also use a PSMA expression score like the one on the right. Another very important trial that was crucial for the FDA approval, this was the VISION trial. So they put in patients that had androgen receptor inhibitor and also taxane regimens, and they made a two to one trial. So they had standard of care plus pluvicto compared to standard of care alone. And what they found, you can see here on the top, progression-free survival median with pluvicto and standard of care was 8.7 compared to standard of care alone, 3.4. And uh, when we look at overall survival, we have 15 compared to 11 months. So it was statistically significant. However, it's not, it's not great. So, so there's still definitely room for improvement. However, it has not been on the market for so long. So let's, let's see what we can improve on that. Talking about side effects, so we normally give Pluvicto in six cycles with six weeks in between the treatments. And you can already see here the little blood drops in between the cycles already um, give you an indication of what's the main problem with Pluvicto. This is the myelosuppression. So we have some levels of anemia, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia and neutropenia. So for example, when you look here, I hope you can see this, otherwise you have to believe me. So grade three anemia is, this is 12, approximately 13% compared to 5% in the standard of care alone group. Or when you look, for example, at thrombocytopenia, you have here 8% compared to 1%. So this is non-negligible. Um, the acute side effects are more fatigue, nausea, decreased appetite, and change in bowel movements. We always say everything's normal between one and seven days, and everything after that must be investigated more. Also, there is some degree of renal toxicity, but it's very, very rare, below 1%, at least in the trials that we have for now. And also, one problem for the patients is dry mouth and eyes, which uh, occurs in approximately 30% of patients. And we have not really found a, um, a cure for that. So what do we do in patients that have a grade 3 problem, like myelosuppression, dry mouth? You can either modify the dose. So with Pluvicto, we reduce it by 20%. You can discontinue the treatment, or you can defer for now and put it to a later time point. So these are many ongoing trials all over the world. I just wanted to highlight two of them that are going on at MSK. Um, so the purpose of these trials is to really look at Pluvicto at an earlier stage before it becomes metastatic castrate resistant. One of them is called PSMA4. This looks at Pluvicto versus um, androgen deprivation therapy in taxane naive men, so before chemotherapy. And even earlier is the PSMA addition this looks at Pluvicto plus standard of care versus standard of care, but in hormonal sensitive prostate cancer patients. And the purpose of it all is to really see whether we can uh, push, uh, push away the um, progression of disease, castrate resistance to a, a later time point, or even prevent it. So I would like to show you a case uh, of a patient that came to us a few weeks ago. This was a 55-year-old male with a metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer. This you can already see on the MIP uh, with um, vast amounts of disease and multiple treatment modalities before he had dose ataxyl, taxa, <coughs> chemo, and also RT. And he was in a really bad shape when he came to us. So every time we do a pluvicto treatment, we make a whole body scan afterwards. It's more of a quality control to see that we don't have any contamination in the arm. 
But nevertheless, it gives us an idea of what is happening. It's of course not diagnostic, but still interesting. So this patient came to us in September. He had anemia, thrombocytopenia, and it was a long discussion whether this patient would even be treated because he was in such a bad shape. And we also gave him a reduced dose here, 160 milligree. So after the first treatment, his platelets dropped even more. He got a, a leukopenia and we, we said, oh, hmm. but still it was to continue again with a reduced dose because his platelets had come up a little, not much change in the whole body image. But then he came back in December and you can already see that there is less uptake in the vast amounts of disease. And also his platelets recovered. So we gave him a full dose. And now he came in January for again, his fourth cycle, again with a full dose, he's doing much better. So of course, unfortunately, it's likely that this is bought time for the patient, but still interesting to see and uh, let's see where he will be after six cycles. And of course, we cannot talk about theranostics without leaving out um, Lutathera. So neuroendocrine tumors are very rare neoplasm. Uh, found out very late because patients have very non-specific symptoms and they're often misdiagnosed and found out uh, at the, a time point where they're already metastatic. Such as, for example, the patient on the right with an ileal met, a net with a hepatic metastases. And 90% of net patients show a somatostatin receptor overexpression in their tumors. And due to its rarity, uh, in the past, treatment options were kind of scarce. And uh, right now, there's a local therapy, of course, mostly surgery if possible, and systemic therapies are mostly chemotherapy, somatostatin analogs, and also Everolimus. So in Europe, since the 90s, there were studies um, investigating endoradiotherapy with, for example, yttrium 90, lutetium-177. And also in the year 2000, the diagnostic part of this theranostic approach has been FDA approved, um, name, namely um, gallium-68 dotatate imaging. And a few years ago, Lutathera has been approved. This is a radio-labeled octreotide derivative. And right now it's FDA approved for unresectable or metastatic progressive SSTR positive gastroenteropathic net. And it should be ideally well differentiated. So grade one and two, we could also do it in grade three, although the data is scarce. It is also FDA approved for bronchopulmonary nets and also for thymic nets, but there's less data on that. So I would like to show you the main study that led to the approval of Lutathera. This was the NETR1 study, an international effort uh, in about 200 patients. And these were patients with inoperable midgut net, and they were progressive with a single dose of long-acting octreotide. And they compared the efficacy and safety of uh, Lutathera and uh, octreotide 30 milligram to a double dose of octreotide, 60 milligram, in these progressive patients. So they had initial results, which i uh, show you on the left. The progression-free survival was not even reached in the Lutathera arm. So they concluded it's a 79% reduction in the risk of death or progression. And this was statistically significant. Also, the overall response rate, so um, partial remission or complete remission was 13% compared to 4% with octreotide. However, when the final analysis came out, it didn't look so rosy because um, the overall survival was 48 versus 36 months and was not st uh, statistically significant. So the authors still said, okay, it's not statistically significant. However, this is 12 months. This is something important in the life of a patient. And maybe it's also due to many patients crossing over to the Lutathera arm. Also, what they concluded was important is the maintenance of the health status in patients and symptom control, so control of the pain, diarrhea, and flushing. What else do we know about Lutathera? So it's also important in pancreatic net, there it has an even better response rate of 45 to 60%. However, overall survival and progression-free survival are slightly shorter. Also, we have some data about bronchial net. Here, um, the response rate is lower 
but um, also only 76% of these nets are SSDR positive, so it also depends on that. And as I told you before, the high grade disease, so grade three, we don't have much evidence on that, but it is being agreed upon that these patients need to have high SSTR expressions, otherwise they do not qualify for this treatment. Now on the left, you can see a patient that had a Lutathera treatment. It, this was originally an ileal net, which was resected, and you see this large hepatic metastasis, uh, which with a high rim uptake, uh, which decreases over time. Also, what is important, because the overall response rate was not amazing, we only had really the 13% 30, in the matter of one trial, but um, in how many patients do we reach a stabilization of disease? So we reach it in approximately, over all the studies we have, 45% of patients. And you can see on the left, this was a study by Quaker Boom et al., you can see that the disease control does make a difference. So the patients that have a stable disease that reach it, that have much better cumulative survival compared to those that have a progressive disease. Also, symptom relief is of course important in life of a patient, and this apparently occurs regardless of objective response that we can see. Also, it has a similar efficacy, but is less toxic than yttrium 90 dodatoc and retreatment seems beneficial. So right now we're only really doing two courses I, with four cycles each and beyond that nobody has really investigated it but there are trials undergoing that hint at a retreatment being beneficial maybe in the future so let's go to the side effects as i told you we have these um, four cycles with eight weeks apart after that we wait for some weeks just to not have on imaging and a pseudo progression that we interpret as disease being progressive due to inflammation. So we wait some time and then we have another dotatate PET. So the acute side effects uh, occur in approximately 25% of patients. These are nausea, vomiting, fatigue, pain, quite similar to Pluvicto. Also something that happens very frequently in 60% of patients is hair thinning, not like with chemo that all is falling out, but really a thinning of hair. Um, and in these patients, we also have a myelosuppression. So grade three or four are below 10%. So we have anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia that are mainly important. We almost see in every patient uh, lympho lymphopenia, which is, but it's not really clinically that relevant. Renal toxicity is very rare in about 1% of patients. And these patients were mostly those that had a renal problem before. But still, one is cautious and says a GFR above 30 is recommended. Another thing is myelodysplastic syndrome and uh, leukemia. This occurs in about 2% of patients, which is quite similar to, for example, external radiation therapy or chemotherapy. With Provicto, for example, we do not know about the myelodysplastic syndrome yet. It's too early. Where do we need to have caution with Lutathera? So these are patients, for example, with mesenteric and peritoneal disease, because they could have a symptom exacerbation with massive pain and bowel obstruction. So in those patients, we like to give steroids, uh, steroid taper afterwards. Also patients with a poor clinical status, so ECOG above two, this means that they, um, 50, more than 50% of their awake time, they stay in bed and they cannot do care, take care of themselves of themselves by themselves and also patients with an intense hormonal syndrome because this can also be exacerbated by this therapy so i would like to show you a case this was a patient that came to our department a few weeks ago a 73 year old male with a g2 metastatic pancreatic net status post whipple procedure octreotide and everolimus and you can already see on this uh, dotatate PET scan that we have liver disease, we have lymph nodes, mediastinal and retroperitoneal. And this is the first uh, whole body scan after the first cycle of Lutathera. So we can see the uptake in the lesions that we saw on the dotatate scan. And this was after the fourth cycle. So all right, also it gives us an idea of what is happening. And then in December, the patient came for the follow-up dotatate scan, and we can see that all of the lesions are less avid, they are smaller, um, new, no new lesions. So a very good response. However, as I told you, only about 13% have 
a reduction in size, whereas about 50% uh, are stabilized. So still to keep that in mind. And I also want to stress the role of FDG PET in the Theranostic approach. FDG PET is our workhorse, and we don't forget about FDG PET, still important. So as you see here, the th in thyroid cancers, in NETS and in prostate cancers, you can see this inverse relationship between differentiation and aggressiveness and how the FDG uptake corresponds to it. So generally, the higher the FDG uptake, the less differentiated and the more aggressive the tumor is. Now I want to also touch on some newer topics that Marius already talked a little bit about. So for example, the um, FAPI imaging, so the fibroblast activation protein inhibitor molecule. Um, so you can see on the right an image that is very beautiful in my opinion, because you can see this high selective uptake in many cancers, and you can see this high tumor to background ratio. and this uh, biodistribution makes it very theoretically a very favorable approach for um, theranostics. So there are not that many studies uh, about FAPI targeted endoradiotherapy. However, this one, for example, is a patient with multiple treatments before breast cancer. And we can already see that lutetium 177 FAP, um, it stayed in the body of the patient for approximately 10 days. You can see on the whole body uh, post-therapy scans, and you can see on the post-treatment uh, PET-CT that the uptake has gone down. So it will be interesting. And uh, the authors also reported a good tolerability. So this will definitely be interesting in the future. Also, we touched upon the chemokine receptor 4, which is important for tumor growth and metastasis. So we have this uh, Pentixa tear. This is a patient with um, multiple myeloma uh, with um, also extra osseous myeloma manifestations. And you can see this Pentixa for high uptake, also high FDG uptake. And then the patient got uh, Pentixa tear. And we can see that the patient had actually a complete metabolic response on FDG PET. And this was the first in human study actually of Pentixa tear. So it will be interesting. This study from Germany also looked at the safety of Pentixa tear, which is also an important topic. You see this patient on the right had uh, acute um, AML. So, and you can see that on the post-therapy scan on the SPECT CT, we have uptake in the lesions that we saw on the Pentixa 4 PET. And they looked at 22 patients with lymphoproliferative or myeloid malignancies, which received 25 courses of Pentixa tear. And the authors called the toxicity profile favorable. I'm not entirely sure whether this is an euphemism because the patients had really a lot of cytopenias. As you can see here, for example, uh, overview of adverse events, you had a number of 340 in 22 patients. And you can see, for example, a grade three uh, thrombopenia in 84% of patients or neutropenia even in 80% of patients. So as a colleague from Vienna said, um, Pentixa tear is sweeping through the bone marrow. So will be interesting to see in the future. And uh, my conclusions for the ones that are established now, the Pluvicto is a very promising approach and may be even superior to second line chemotherapy. But important to know that approximately 20 to 30% of patients are not eligible due to low or variable uptake. So please do not forget about FTG PET CT. Response rate is 50 to 60%. However, response duration is limited, but we only have preliminary data so far. And do not forget about the toxicity. For Lutathera, it's efficient, has been around for some time, at least in studies in Europe, and it's generally well tolerated. Here also response rate about 50 to 60%, but there is more evidence for the benefit in overall survival needed. And caution in patients with peritoneal mesenteric disease hormonal syndrome, and a bad clinical status, and also toxicity, an important side effect. So what are the emerging directions of this? So with PSMA, as I showed you the trials that are ongoing, PSMA will be interesting in earlier stages of disease to prevent or prolong or put away the progression to a later time point. Also, we want to understand the mechanisms of resistance to PSMA. And there are methods being developed to enhance PSMA expression. 
Also something will be interesting will be alpha emitters. For SSTR targeted theranostics, it will be interesting to see whether we can combine Luthothera with Yttrium-90. Yttrium-90, as I told you, for the larger metastases and Luthothera for the smaller ones. Also, there are trials underway for that uh, look at intra-arterial PRT, or also a combination of intravenous and intra-arterial. Also, SSTR antagonists are being developed that uh, have maybe a higher affinity to the receptor. And multiple courses of repeat treatment might be beneficial. However, we have to see how this turns out with toxicity profile and with malignancies and myelodysplastic syndrome. Then the new exciting theranostic targets, CX, CR4 and FAPI. Very excited to hear what's, what will happen with those. And general perspectives will be, it's very good, it would be nice to have some response assessment criteria that show us um, real guidelines for, uh, for Dodatate PET and also uh, PSMA PET to really put that into uh, context. Also dosimetry, because right now we're giving patients a fixed amount of activity and it would be interesting to see what happens if we really um, make the activity uh, kind of give the patient activity according to the patient himself. Dosimetry is something that is very complicated, but maybe there are other um, or better methods in the future. Also, of course, combination strategies are exciting. So to combine theranostics with, for example, immunotherapy. And the goal of it all would be to give the right treatment to the right patients at the right time in terms of precision medicine, which, which is where we want to go. So thank you very much for your attention.